The Lord be with you. Hello again and welcome to this week's talk from St John's in Highbridge. Let's pray. God of glory, the end of our searching. Help us to lay aside all that prevents us from seeking your kingdom and to give all that we have to gain the pearl beyond price through our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. So my talk today is based on Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. I seem to have spent most of my life in the company of Bridges. I grew up in a little village on the Firth of Forth in Fife in central Scotland. And from, um, from there you can see the three bridges that join the um, Kingdom of Fife uh, to the north with the Lothians and Edinburgh to the south. And the oldest and the most famous of these bridges is the Fourth Rail Bridge, for years just called the Fourth Bridge. It was completed in 1890 with its great diamond-shaped um, cantilevers, three of them. And next to this is the Fourth Road Bridge, which is a suspension bridge, completed in 1964. And every day as a child, those were the two bridges that I saw. And in 2017, they were finally joined by a third, the Queensferry Crossing, with its beautiful sail-like towers. At present, um, it's the tallest bridge in the UK. What are bridges for, then? Well, put very simply, they help people to cross over. They overcome obstacles and connect us with the land beyond. Sometimes that obstacle is pretty small, just a stream or a ditch. Other times it's spectacular, like the Avon Gorge or indeed the Firth of Forth. Bridges overcome divides, even those that seem impossible. Our story today in Matthew's Gospel is precisely about divides and bridges and crossing over. On one side of the divide is a Canaanite woman, and on the other side is Jesus and the kingdom of God. The divide between them is formidable. It runs deep and wide. Firstly, this woman is a Canaanite. She's a Gentile. And Jews, like Jesus and his friends, don't usually associate with Gentiles. Secondly, she's a woman, and thus a second-class citizen in the culture of that time. Respectable women don't shout after men in the street, but this woman is desperate. The cause of her desperation? Well, this tells us the third aspect of the divide between her and Jesus. Her daughter, we discover, is tormented by a demon. Again, in this culture, it means that, well, she's to be avoided and to be feared. There's something very badly wrong in her family. Now it's hard for us to imagine the social and cultural and religious gulf that lies between this woman and the help she needs. If we were to picture that divide as a body of water, then it's swarming with slimy creatures, prejudice, racism, sexism, fear of madness or worse. Now, if we were to look for a modern equivalent, we might perhaps think of what happens or what may happen when we meet a homeless person. I meet quite a few of them here in Highbridge and men and women come to my door sometimes seeking help. Now, when I meet um, a homeless person, I become very aware of what separates them from me. I just can't help it. They look different, they sound different, they smell different. Often, I think many of us find we don't want to get too close to them. I'm not saying any of this is right, it's just what we instinctively do. We recoil, inwardly at least, at greasy hair and dirty skin. We judge a homeless person with a fearful glance. Are they mentally ill? Are they an addict? Are they dangerous? These are men and women who've slipped from the clean side of society to, if you like, the unclean. 
And this frightens and disturbs us, if we're honest. However, our compassionate, her, sorry, however compassionate our response may be, there is a divide, and I think it is real. Now, when the Canaanite woman starts shouting at Jesus and the disciples from the roadside, they seem merely to perpetuate this sense of division. The woman remarkably actually uses all the right titles for Jesus. She calls him Lord and Son of David, but to no effect. When they finally do acknowledge her, it's only to highlight the gap, which is reinforced by a theology which says God is not on the side of Gentile women whose children are possessed. So send her away, they say to Jesus. And puzzlingly, Jesus seems at first to concur. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he says, and by extension, not to Gentiles. So finally, in desperation, the woman comes and kneels before Jesus in a posture of prayer. And she offers him her desperation in words of just one syllable. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. She's got nothing left. Just herself. Her soul laid bare before this wandering rabbi. Now Jesus' response to her is even more puzzling than his silence. It's not fair to take the children's food, he says, and throw it to the dogs. Ouch. Jesus appears here to be using that stock phrase, a common term of insult. He's speaking, as it were, I suppose, in quotation marks, but that's no less hurtful, no less problematic. What Jesus says does, however, make absolute sense within the story. Jesus is underscoring for we who are listening in just how great that gulf is that lies between this woman and what she seeks. Now perhaps Jesus knows all along what he's going to do. Perhaps he's coaxing her to see what she'll say next. In any case, there is hope. For while there is dialogue between the two, the woman and the Lord, a bridge is already being built. <coughs> Whatever Jesus is doing, our heroine rises to the challenge. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. It's a brilliant comeback, one that subverts the original insult and turns it into something positive, warm, appealing even. When a good and generous master sits down at the table. Even the household dogs get to eat. The woman believes, despite their differences, that Jesus is a good and generous master. And so she kneels, awaiting his response. The bridge between them, then, is almost complete. Its foundations are need, attention, persistence and hope. But the bridge itself is built of one thing alone, faith. Faith is the one thing that can vault over the deep divisions of this world and overcome obstacles that lock us in hatred. Faith says, I see you, I trust you, I am willing to stick with you, even if it means both of us battling some hard stuff in the process. So then, it's for her faith, ultimately, that Jesus commends this woman. You've spoken with faith, Jesus seems to say. Now you understand what it means to be my disciple. And with that, her daughter is healed. This gospel story today is not an easy one, just as the gospel itself is not easy. To follow God is in a sense to put up with God's maddening silences, his seeming complicity in a suffering world and his puzzling turns. 
To follow God is to feel the gaps and the gulfs that persist in our understanding, in our theology, in our ethics. To follow God is to feel the divide, sometimes canyon-like, between our real lives and the lives we feel we ought to be living. Faith, however, is the bridge that crosses those divides. Faith is the agent of change. It's the structure of salvation. Whenever two estranged people begin to trust one another again, it is faith that builds that bridge. You don't get there without difficulty and without sacrifice. Of the 4,600 people it took to build the fourth rail bridge, 73 died in the process. Bridge building is much safer now, of course, but it's no less costly. What then, I wonder, is the cost and the promise of our faith? Well, firstly, there's a cost and a promise for the church. The church is an institution founded on the experience of learning to welcome and cherish those previously thought unclean. We too, in our generation, have to learn to step beyond familiar boundaries and reach out to the uncomfortable person who kneels before us in need. For the only time the church ever advances in holiness is when it gets its hands dirty. We see this with St Francis kissing the leper, with Catherine Booth ministering to the alcoholics, with countless ministries today among the poor, the outcast and the incarcerated. It's when we cross those divides, when we bridge those gaps, that we find Jesus already there and his hands are dirty too. But if I were to suggest that our gospel story today were merely a moralistic tale about trying hard, I would have done you a great disservice. Jesus rightly commends the costly faith of this Canaanite woman, but that alone cannot be the meaning of the story. For if faith becomes just another tool to master, just another great effort to make, just another quality we have to somehow dredge up from within ourselves, then it's not really faith at all. It's merely willpower. Sometimes as Christians we make this mistake and we wonder why our bridges and our empires crumble. But Christianity teaches that the true bridge has already been built. It was built by Christ on the cross. The true cost of faith has already been paid. It was paid by Christ on the cross. For all the Canaanite woman's faith in God, you see, it was not that that healed her daughter. It was God's faith in her. Salvation, healing, is a miracle. It's a gift. Unearned, undeserved, indiscriminate, as this story eventually reveals. Faith comes from God, from end to end, from shore to shore. And this is tremendously good news. It's good news for all of us who feel we lack even the requisite mustard seed of faith to see real change and real progress in our lives. Even the mustard seed is God's gift to you. And it can move mountains only because God delights to make it do so. God has faith enough to bridge any gap between earth and heaven, between life and death, between heaven and hell even. And God has faith in you too. In Jesus, God has built the bridge for all time and for all people. He has laid his cross beam across the chasm of our broken lives and said, come on, cross over. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. So, if you ever find yourself standing distant, 
on the far side of joy, looking longingly toward a love and an acceptance that seems like an impossible dream, then Jesus is here to remind you that it is not impossible because God has done it. God has built that bridge in Jesus Christ. Ours is simply to ask and to receive.